Hi, I'm Alex L., and I write books for a living. The Hey Girl podcast was created with sisterhood and storytelling in mind. Hey girl. Hey girl. Hey girl. Hey girl. <laughs> I'll be sitting down with some phenomenal women to discuss love. I believe we grew distant out of love of some type. Like, yeah. I don't want to hurt you. Loss. Really don't know what's going to trigger that feeling of right. grief in any moment. And a topic very important to my work, self-care. I'm holding on to this self-care with every ounce of me. <laughs> Join us as we journey through sharing together. This week's guest is Gabrielle. So I've never met Gabrielle in person, but I have seen her beautiful family on YouTube. When I found out that Gabrielle and her husband were struggling with the same infertility issues my husband and I were struggling with, which happened to be male factor, I was floored because it's rare that other women are sharing their stories around so fertility. Rare. Right. So one thing that Gabe and I talk about in this episode is setting boundaries within the internet space. How much is, is enough? Like I want enough for our viewers to understand, but also right. you don't have to see every single thing. So while yes, it is very important to have boundaries and balance, it's also extremely powerful when people share their stories. We didn't have to tell that we had IVF, right. but it was important for us to be authentic and talk about it because it was a huge journey for us. I was so happy that she agreed to be on the show and talk about her fertility journey with me. There are so many people out there going through a variety of things and mm -hmm. you fit in there somewhere. Just, just be honest and don't feel ashamed. This is Gabe's story. Hey girl. Hey girl. Oh my gosh. I am so excited to have you on the show. Thank you for agreeing to chat with me today. How are you? Absolutely. I'm doing really good. Thank you so much for even reaching out and having me. I'm so excited. You're my very first podcast interview. Hey, there we go. <laughs> yes. I'm That's awesome to hear. So you and I have something very intimate in common. So that is what I want to talk about for those listeners who are not familiar with you and what you do. Can you just give us a little bit of a rundown of who you are before we get started? Absolutely. I'm Gabrielle Flowers Raider, also known as Gabe Flowers. I have a daily vlog that I do with my husband and my son called Gabe Babe TV. We post videos uh, Monday through Friday on YouTube, and it's just a blog of our life. So you get to see unscripted reality and how we go about our days and challenges and all things like that. I am currently pregnant. We are expecting a baby girl in January, so we're super excited about that. And uh, yeah, I feel like that's that's pretty much most of it. I do have another channel, The Gabe Fix, where I do like hair and beauty and all that other stuff. But most people are familiar with me from Gabe Babe TV. Awesome. So you and your husband have a similar story to me and my husband. And that's why I wanted to have you on the show. Just to give people just kind of a rundown about me and my husband's fertility issues. We got pregnant last year and had a miscarriage in January. And we found out that my husband had male factor infertility issues and that his sperm was not up quite up to par and that specifically his morphology was off, which is the shape of the sperm which causes issues as far as egg penetration. So once we found that out, we started getting fertility support. And when I watched your your video with your husband about your Q&A on how you guys conceived after your loss, I was literally floored because it's rare that other women are sharing their stories around so fertility, rare. right, yeah. specifically with male factor. I'm going to let you I'm going to let you kind of tell <laughs> your story, but how okay. did the fertility journey start for you guys? It started for us. We were trying. We had no problem conceiving our son. Like it happened mm -hmm. within three months. So we always thought that it would be no problem the second time around. And we started trying and trying and 
we went about a year and we're like, okay. So then at the year mark, we finally got pregnant. And then shortly after we miscarried, fast forward another year of trying again, it's like, okay, this is not coming as easy as we thought it was. So we thought it would be. So we decided to just go and get checked out. So I went, made an appointment, saw RE, and he went to the urologist. And what we found out was that he has varicose veins Mm -hmm. that are the contributing factor to messing with his morphology for the Mm -hmm. sperm. Mm -hmm. And they gave us some options there. And they said, you can either have surgery that could possibly correct it, or you could try other things as well, IUI, IVF. And we, we weren't really sure what we thought about the surgery. You know, my husband is like, that's a big deal. Having yeah. surgery down there, like you never right. know. So <laughs> we were like, okay, well, let's just try some IUIs. We tried three IUIs and they were unsuccessful. And we just, we kind of got a little discouraged and we we're like, okay, let's, let's just pray about it because the next step would be either surgery or IVF. And my husband still wasn't quite on board with IVF. So that's when he wasn't quite on board with the surgery. So Mm -hmm. that's why we decided to go ahead and try the IVF. And it was successful. That is, when I tell you almost to a T, that is me and Ryan's story. That is so Um, And that's why I'm so floored because (laughs) for us, we had been, we'd been trying for two years. So we tried for almost a year. And then around that year mark, we got pregnant and then had our miscarriage. And then we tried again for another year. And that was with fertility assistance. We did almost nine IUIs, I want to say, and they were all unsuccessful. So so what a lot of people don't know about how this baby was conceived, because I've been waiting to talk to you to share this news, (laughs) is that we ended up having to do IVF and we got pregnant on the first try and you and I are actually due around the same time. Yes, we are January babies. Yes. (laughs) And I, I just, nobody understands this type of intensity until they're in it. And that's another reason why I wanted to talk to you because IVF is a big step. It's expensive. So I want to talk about the healthcare aspect. And luckily, our healthcare covered 90% of our IVF, which serious? was a blessing. Oh, yes, they did. Praise yeah. God for that. <laughs> praise God for that. Because I was, re- I was really scared. But you know what? With timing, during that year of our nine IUIs or eight IUIs, I forget how many, it was so many, the insurance wouldn't cover it. I switched wow. over insurance, didn't even research if they, if my new insurance would do fertility support. They happened to cover fertility support after you meet your deductible. So out of pocket, we only, we paid under $10,000 out of pocket oh for all gosh. of our medication, all of our treatment. So oh, I want to amazing. talk to you about that. Were you, first of all, scared at the cost because it's a huge investment worth it but huge and all the shots and things that you had to take and your husband how did he feel about that knowing that quote unquote this was his issue quote unquote and how did that affect you guys's connecting and partnership if at all okay well we when we first kind of found out about his infertility issues, I think that it it did something for him a little bit because it's mm-hmm. this feeling of I can't, I can't provide, I can't do this, like this is my fault. And you know, I made sure that I stressed to him that I don't look at it as your issue or my issue. This is our issue right, together. Right, you know, right. like I'm not placing blame on you. I don't feel any way different towards you because this could have very well been on the opposite side. And I know that you wouldn't have felt differently towards me. So I made sure exactly. that I stressed that, you know, I, I did not feel any type of way. This, there was a reason that we were going through this. And I think God put us through this so that we could share our story. It, it, the cost was a, was a huge deal for us because we are, you know, we're self-employed. We pay mm-hmm. for our own insurance. My husband, mm-hmm. he's a veteran, so he's covered by the VA. And I was just like, okay, I searched and searched and searched and tried to find loopholes and everything. And my insurance was like, nope, we, we're not covering anything. So it was all out of pocket. And oh. we were kind of in a place where we also felt 
blessed because we had the money. Like we didn't right. have to, we didn't have to take out loans. We didn't have to use credit cards. We had mo- this money saved. And yeah. I'm like, okay, you know what? This, that was kind of the deciding factor for us as well. Like, okay, this, we are, we have the ability to do this. So maybe this is really what God wants us to do, but it was tough. Like it's, it's, it's a huge investment when you spend that type of money for, IVF because you you don't really know if it's going to work or not. We even paid more to have two tries. So we pay, we went with a program where we could have two egg retrievals and then unlimited frozen egg transfers. Mm-hmm. And thankfully we didn't have to use that second one, but it was just kind of that security of having having that extra extra try. Right. Because, you know, the IUIs were unsuccessful. So you never know. There are so many women that have to go through IVF multiple times. Yes. So yeah, it was, it was, it was a blessing, but um, it was definitely stressful. The shots, I didn't realize how many shots I was going to be <laughs> giving <Girl>. myself. <laughs> like I honestly, you know, I remember sitting in there and listening to the doctor go over the procedure and all this paperwork, but I just had no, I had no idea how many shots that I was getting ready to endure. And thankfully, I don't have an issue with needles. They didn't bother me, but it's just just the fact of doing it. Like, and I did all of my shots leading up to the retrieval. I did them all myself, the ones in my, in my stomach. But then when it got time to have the progesterone shots uh, in my bum, Chad had to help me with that. He did those every single one, except like two, he did, he was a trooper. And we did that up until our 11th week of pregnancy. But yeah, it was crazy. (laughs) It's intense. It is so so intense. It's so intense. And I found that you know, I like how you said that it wasn't his issue. It was mm-hmm. our issue. And that is something that is so important when you're walking through this fertility journey, specifically after loss and so many disappointments, because it can get really hard and yeah. emotionally trying. And for Ryan and I, what really brought us closer, because we were both extremely stressed out. We were just like, what, why are we going through this? And my situation was a little different because I had my daughter who's will be 10 from a previous relationship. And when she was conceived, I had no business conceiving. And also (laughs) it was just quick, fast and in a hurry. Mm -hmm. Right. And now I'm with this man who I adore and I love, and he's my best friend and we're married and we're financially stable. And we just are, we're just in this space where, yes, let's expand our family. And the fact that it took us so long was really, I feel like God trying to bring us together and test us. Like, are y'all really in this? Like, here's one of these, these trials that I'm going to throw at y'all. Y'all really in this. And what brought us closer was he would give me my shots. So every night Ryan would fill up my syringe and he would give me my shots. And it was so, it was so unreal that we were going through that, even with the egg retrieve. I'm like, I'm about to go under and get my eggs retrieved. And Mm -hmm. it's just, (laughs) it's crazy. It's so crazy. Like Chad was there every step of the way and he would have given me those shots, but I'm a little independent. I was like, I got this, I got this, but I was, I couldn't do the other ones. When it came to the other ones, I was like, no, I need some help. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. I was just, you know, I wanted it to be something that because I I just had a feeling that Ryan it was going to work the first time and it Mm -hmm. did thank God and I was like I want Ryan to be included in this every step of the way because they already feel like you know it's just it can be an ego hit and it can be Mm -hmm. a a self-esteem hit so how did you work through that with your husband just making sure that he felt like he wasn't doing this to you and that you guys were really truly like in this together while you were going through this process. It's not a quick process. It's what over six weeks. It's definitely not a quick process at all. Like it's yeah, six to eight weeks. If you like, cause we had a frozen egg transfer. So he sent our embryos out to get tested. Like it was a long process. And I, I think that the biggest thing for us was just keeping the communication open and talking about how we were feeling in the moment, if I had feelings of whatever, I was I was able to express them 
to him and vice versa. So I think that us just being able to like talk about it, going through all these steps together, I never went to an appointment by myself. Like he was Mm -hmm. always with me. So Mm -hmm. I think that that was great because it was truly our journey together. You know, he wanted to know what they were going to say just as much as I did. So he's like, no, I don't care. You just go to get your blood drawn. I'm going with you. I'm going with you. Right. So exactly. Right there. (laughs) Exactly. Let the nurse take my blood. Okay. (laughs) So I think that it was, it was just great for us to, to be able to go through that together and just kind of lean on each other when we needed to, because it is stressful. It is so stressful. And especially for us, filming our life daily, but then, I was going to ask that next. Yeah. <laughs> yes. And, but then also having this big major thing that we're going through that we're not speaking about publicly. Mm-hmm. So of mm-hmm. course we had our family and our close friends who knew, but right. there was no mention of it at all until after the fact. So that was kind of difficult because you have to put on this, this faith in mm-hmm. essence, and you know, you could really be stressed, you could really not be feeling it, your hormones are raging, you feel bloated, and people calling you fat, and then they're speculating if you're pregnant, and it's like, okay, right. <laughs> right. y'all have right. no idea. I could not no wait idea. <laughs> to make the video that we made explaining everything because I'm like, I can't, I can't hold this secret any longer. <laughs> like, I just, so I can't do it. So, how does that feel for you just setting those boundaries? So, being on the internet is a interesting place to be specifically when you have a platform specifically when you are sharing intimate moments of your life and your family how are you able to create those boundaries within you know I'm not going to document every time I give myself a shot I'm not going to you know I'm not going to share this part you know it's it's one of those things we really had to sit and think about and talk about okay how much do we want to share how much do we want to keep? Now, we we filmed a lot. I filmed a whole lot. Like I have fit footage of my very first time giving myself a shot. And I didn't do every single shot because at the time going through it, I'm like, I want, I know that I want footage, but I don't know what I want to do with it yet or how I want to present it. So right. I was just kind of getting moments here and there. And then there are certain things that we didn't get. Like we didn't get the phone, the or reaction where we got the phone call from the doctor and he told us we had, you know, one normal baby girl. And, you know, I sometimes I'm like, oh man, I wish I would have filmed that. But, you know, that was a moment for us. So mm-hmm. it, it, it kind of worked out that way where some of the things I didn't get, like, you know, telling my grandmother that we were having a girl, I didn't get her initial reaction because some of those things we were just living and we decided not to pull out the camera for. But a lot of it we did get and we presented it you know, kind of in like a throwback form, just showing older footage. But it it is one of those things you really have to think about, like, okay, how much is is enough? Like, I want enough for our viewers to understand, but also, you know, have to see every single thing. So it's it's just about finding finding the balance there. Yes, we went through the process. Here's some of it, but you don't get to see everything I've showed enough of me crying. I mean, it was some <laughs> vulnerable moments that we showed, yeah. but there were yeah. a lot more that were off camera. Yeah. So, yeah. And I think, I think that's what a lot of people don't understand when it comes to the internet and when it comes to sharing on the internet, because everything isn't depicted. Everything isn't always spoken on or spoken about. And I think when, I think when we're giving these platforms, We are able to use our voice to share our story and prayerfully, hopefully, inspire someone else, inspire another woman's voice, inspire another family's voice. So I really like that you said it's all about finding balance. Me, I I decided that I'm not publicly announcing the gender. I'm not publicly announcing the date that we're giving birth. You're the first person who isn't in our immediate circle who I told we're due in January. So people oh, know that I'm now. Sorry, I'm, not to say that. I'm so sorry. No, it's okay. No, it's fine. So um sorry. but there's just certain things that we're keeping to ourselves, ultrasound mm-hmm. photos, you know, things like that because there's a few reasons why I'm navigating it this way. Number one is being in the TTC, trying to conceive community has softened me and made me so much more empathic and emotionally aware of how other people are navigating their journey. Um, and I just don't want 
a part of me, I I know you probably listened to the Kenya episode where she's like, scream your joy and tell it. And yes. it's amazing. And I, it was hard for me because it's like, I don't want anyone to feel like I'm throwing this pregnancy in their face, even though that's not the case. Humans, we have feelings and we are very vulnerable beings. Also, because this is so sacred for me, I just feel like, oh it's my yours. gosh, yeah. it's, it's mine. And oh. I'm allowed to keep it. I struggled with that a little bit too, especially when you're on the internet and people, you know, your tribe on the internet is like, we love you. We're so happy for you. Tell us, tell us, tell us. Yeah. They want to know everything. <laughs> oh yeah. They want to know everything. everything. And it's no, it's, it's a beautiful thing, but it's also something that, you know, we just have to learn to find our boundaries and our balance. So, so with true. that being said, what was your viewers reactions about you guys having to go through IVF? Did you get a lot of questions? Was there any pushback? And if so, how did you deal with those things? We, you know, honestly, the response was overwhelmingly positive. It, it was a, a bit of a surprise to me. I mean, just because you never know how people are going to take things. Of course, you know, of course, you're always going to have people on the other side that feel like, right. Oh my goodness, you paid to have a baby. Oh my goodness, you paid to have a girl. Blah, 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 blah. It's like, you know what? I'm not even going there with you, okay? Because I know that this was for us, okay? And this is how God wanted us to do it. But people were so grateful that we were open and upfront and transparent about the journey. Because honestly, we didn't have to tell that we had IVF. Like it's not required for us to share every single thing that happened. So we could have very well just played this off like, ah, we got pregnant. But right. it was important for us to be authentic and talk about it because it was a huge journey for us. And there are so many people that don't talk about it. And right. I think that that was another thing, especially like we had so many factors, like this was a long journey for us. It was male infertility related right. and you don't hear about that very often. So I think that the response was overwhelmingly positive because people were just glad that we were authentic and transparent with them. That's wonderful. That is so wonderful. No one talks about male factor. When I was looking mm -hmm. online, trying to find my husband, every herb, it's every so remedy, hard. There was nothing. There was nothing. no information. And I felt really alone. So when I tell you when I discovered you guys were <laughs> pregnant and that y'all were due around the same time and that we had all these aligning factors, when I tell you I screamed, I was like, <laughs> yes. yes. Oh, my gosh. Oh, no, right? And I was like, I wonder... I wonder what their fertility diagnosis was. And then you said male factor. And I said, oh, my goodness. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, because it's no crazy. one no one, no one is about talking it. about it. Why do you think no one is talking about male factor? Because so many people actually, when I started sharing that my husband, we started sharing bits and pieces of our fertility journey mm -hmm. last year. And I shared that he had some male factor issues. People were still convinced that it was my womb and you. I yes. was I need to steam my yoni and I need to do all this wild stuff and it's yes. like come on like I get it like I'm down for yoni steaming but this is not like that I don't need but no. this is not that this is like, not about me not, and it's not yeah. that right so well, why do you think people don't speak up about male factor and how come you think it's so stigmatized about around fertility issues being women centered I was just about to say it's such a stigma and I think that yeah. it just it goes back to the world that we live in and the gender roles and it is seen as a woman's role to have this child to to even though it takes two it very right. well takes two to make this baby it's just seen as such a womanly duty so you know it's so crazy so many people just assumed that it was me before we said anything and i'm getting all types of suggestions just like you said and i'm like if only you guys knew well when you know that all of these suggestions are null and void because they're not going to help us. But I think that it's just the world that we live in and how, you know, when you think of all things motherly and having children and women, like having babies, you think of women and it's, it's a thing like men are strong and that they don't, they don't have as much responsibility in it as you do when it, it's really 50 50. Like it takes right. both of us to make this child. But I just, I right. think that that's just not how people are wired unfortunately. Yeah. And I, I agree with that a hundred percent. And I'm really happy that we're having this conversation because now like we're two 
women of color, black women, yeah. talking about how our partners have suffered with male factor infertility, no matter how severe or how mild. And we both came out, we all four of us came out yeah. on the other side with no shame mm-hmm. and with this sense of celebration that, you know what, we're in this together. And not only are we in it together, but we have a community of people who are also, you know, just in this with us. In this, exactly. And don't maybe don't have anybody to talk to or exactly. anybody that understands it. And it's, just, right. it's, it's helpful to know that you're not the only one going through what you're going through, like down to the, the small details. Absolutely. So yeah. I want to dive into your YouTube career and your family. <laughs> okay. How did you guys, so I've seen quite a few of your videos. Y'all okay. are so cute. <laughs> and, Thank you. <laughs> I mean, over the years, I've, you know, I don't really watch YouTube that much, but when I have, I'm like, oh, let me check out my families mm-hmm. that I like. How has that been for you guys being on YouTube and sharing your family, your sweet little boy, and now this little girl is coming and you're going to share that, of course, too. Yeah, How has that absolutely. been for you guys? It's, you know, it's been the biggest unexpected blessing because for us, YouTube started solely as a hobby. It was something mm. for us to do. I had a YouTube channel before I even met Chad. And, you know, I'm just putting up just random stuff, fashion and cooking and anything that I can think of because it was an outlet for me. And then mm-hmm. once he came into the picture, I noticed that people uh, that I started, that I were watching started blogging. And I'm like, what is this thing, blogging? What is this? (laughs) And I remember uh, something that was really popular called Vlogtober. You blog every day in October. And I saw a couple doing it and I'm like, okay, babe, we should try this. We were newlyweds. This was in October. We had gotten married that August in 2011. And I'm like, let's just try it, you know? So we, we did it. We didn't do every day in October. We probably put up maybe 15, 10 or 15 videos that month, but that was a lot for us. And right. we, you know, we were like, um, okay, thanks guys. Maybe we'll come back around the holidays. It's been fun. And people were like, no, you should keep it going. We love watching you guys. And I don't know, we kind of <laughs> looked at each other like, okay, people are really watching us. <laughs> like, and we weren't right. doing anything special at all. We were in uh, the smallest town ever savannah tennessee like population of six thousand. like literally we weren't doing anything fancy (laughs) but people i guess just liked our realness and our authenticity so it has just from there turned into something that we never would have imagined at the time we started we were both working full time Mm -hmm. and you know now it's full-time work for both of us this is this is what we do primarily Mm -hmm. So and it's just opened so many doors. We've been able to work with so many awesome brands and meet so many wonderful people and just touch and inspire people across the globe, like all over. Like that's the the greatest thing, like this extended family that we have because we just decided to pick up the camera and share our lives. It's like the best feeling. It's the best feeling ever. It's awesome. That, oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Um, yeah. How do you set boundaries with sharing your son, if you have you, any? You know, we, we're pretty open about the things we share with him. The one thing that we do not share is us disciplining him mm-hmm. because we just we just kind of feel like it's not necessary um, right. for people to see. Now, of course, that opens up for the conversation that he doesn't get disciplined because, you know, some people feel like if they don't see it, it doesn't happen. There are certain things like we just we just don't feel like that's necessary. We don't show, you know, we're very private about places. So we're not showing, you know, where he goes to school or saying the name of his school because we're very, you know, we're really sticklers about our privacy in right. that manner. It's something that he has grown up with and it's 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 interesting to see the shift in him because he he's always had a camera in his face. So now he will pick up the camera and like blog us or blog himself. So it's actually <laughs> really cute to see this little vlogger that we've created because that's that's all he knows. So yeah, it's 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 been fun to watch oh, that. Oh, that is yeah. that's really amazing. Ah, oh, so cute. <laughs> is he excited to be a big brother? Oh my goodness, he is so excited. Everything now is when I'm a big brother. 
First mm-hmm. it was, you know, I'm going to take showers when I become a big brother. Then it was, <laughs> I'm going to sleep in my bed all night when I become a big brother. I'm like, I'm going to hold you to all of these things now. Okay. So everything he equates to being a big brother. He asked me the other day, he was like, am I going to be a big boy when I'm a big brother? I'm like, yeah, you're a big boy now, but yeah, you're really going to be big because you're going to be looking after your sister, you know, but it's just, he's so excited and he runs up every now and then and he'll hug me and he'll kiss my belly or talk to his baby sister. It is, it just melts my heart. It is the cutest thing ever because I have wanted to see him in a sibling role for so long. And I think yeah. that even though w- we wanted our kids, you know, to be, two years apart, but I feel like he'll be five in January. And this is like the perfect age because he understands it. He's going to be able to help. Like, I think that this is just like the best age gap for them. He's potty trained. He's potty trained. (laughs) Yes. You don't have to have two in diapers. Okay. Right. Right. It's a lot self-sufficient so it's it's gonna be it's gonna be great yeah I was <laughs> and I'm sure you really feel that way with oh my gosh old. I was just about to say you know Charlie Charlie she will be uh 10 in November and I you know I would it would have been ideal if my husband and I were able to conceive when she was like seven you know but she still would have been older but now you know she's much older. And I was really nervous about that. I was concerned. I really didn't know how to navigate that space. She's been the only child for almost 10 years. Like, how is that going to affect her? And it's actually been, she's really excited to be a big sister, but she's also nervous, you know, Mm. and she has some anxiety around it. So last weekend we went to big sister class that was offered at the local hospital. Yeah. Yeah. And it was just me and her and they showed her how to swaddle and to diaper and gave her all these good big sister roles and how she can help me and the baby and my husband. And they let her tour labor and delivery and she got to ask questions. And it was such a relief because I didn't know how to approach it. You know, her little emotions were just all over the place. (laughs) Understandably, yes. Now she feels like I'm going to be a big sister I have a role to play. I'm going to help my mama and my papa with my baby. I was just about to say the gender. With with Uh, my new baby. (laughs) (laughs) With my new baby that's coming. And it just, it really solidified the fact that we are family and we are all in this together. So that has just been so special to see unfold. I can't wait to see her with the baby. She's going to be like, mama number two I'm sure uh, she will be definitely <laughs> like my, my uh, sister and I are 13 years apart so oh, okay. I can definitely identify with with that and it, it, yeah it's the best thing like the closer are you older or younger I'm older okay so okay. I have a question for you mm-hmm. how did you feel when you found out at 13 that <laughs> a new baby was coming and how did your parents help you navigate that well, you know, <laughs> I I don't think that I was happy right up front because I always wanted, you know, my mom to have another child. I have siblings on my father's side, but we never lived together. So I always wanted my mom to have another child. But at 13, I'm like, what's the point now? I'm getting ready to go to high school. Like, I'm going to have to watch this child. It, yeah. So initially... I wasn't excited, but eventually I did get to that. And then, of course, once she got here, I loved her to death. But, you know, I think my mom was just she was really good at, you know, making sure that I was included and that I knew everything that was going on. And my mom was, you know, was basically a single mother at this time because she was not, um, you know, married to my sister's father. So. Mm -hmm. You know, she was she was very good at keeping me involved. And I was right there with her when she gave birth. Like I saw it all. So it was just us like it was just just us. And she made me, you know, feel like nothing was going to change. Like that was not going to change once my baby sister came. It was going to be the three of us like we, you know, there's just one more person to the team. So yeah. it, it was good eventually. But I, I do have to admit that I was just like, uh, this could have happened like six years ago, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> right. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's great. So I want to I want to wrap up, but I want to ask you three self-care tips that you would give to entrepreneurial women, new moms, and 
families who are going through fertility issues and and what they can do to lean on each other in love and also stand tall through the process. Okay, let's see. Three tips. My my number one tip is to stay in prayer. And that was something that really helped me get through this stay in prayer with your significant other as well. Like it, it will bring you so much closer, especially if you're going through a journey like this, or you're having a trying time, like you, you have to stick together because it can very well tear you apart. But prayer, staying prayerful is like number one on top of my list. The second thing would be to make sure you take time for yourself. I think especially as moms and entrepreneurs, like we're trying to do everything for everybody else. It's yes, this, yes, this, yes, that. But you have to kind of learn to say no. And I've been kind of doing that myself because it's been an issue. But learning Mm -hmm. how to say no and making sure you're carving out time to do what refills you, whatever it is, you know, if Mm -hmm. it's taking a walk, if it's going to get a pedicure, if it's just meditating, if it's reading a book, finding what gives you fuel and making sure that you carve out time to do that. And then I think the last thing, Hmm, this is, this is a good one. Let's see. What's the last one that I can, um, you know, just, just be honest, Mm. be honest and be transparent and don't feel ashamed because there are so many people out there going through a variety of things and Mm -hmm. you fit in there somewhere and you never know who you're going to bless by sharing your story or who you're going to touch, who you're going to inspire. So don't, don't keep it all to yourself. Learn to, to give a little bit and share some and, and be real and be authentic and be vulnerable because people are drawn to that. Mm, I love it. I love it all. Thank you so much, Gabriel. I Thank this was wonderful. Hey, yeah, good talking to you. <laughs> Great. Have a good one. <laughs> Hey Girl is a member of the District Productive Network. Produced by Jamie Benson and me, Alex L. Music provided by DC's own Kokai. Kokai.